that. So I moved all the text to the top because I realized you couldn't see the bottom. It's <laughs> the top either. <laughs> um, it says, creating apps kids love. And as Warren said, I am Jason. I work with Sego Sego and we're based in Toronto. Um, I enjoy questions, so I'm going to see how quickly we can move through a slide like this. So we can allow some time for that. So, a little burst mode at the beginning. I'm from Canada. Looks a lot like this. I work with these people. They're lovely people. We create apps for kids uh, and primarily focused on uh, the ages around three years old. And cats. Uh, that explains it. Yeah. It's our user testing in action here. Uh, I don't know this cat. Um, I, I have no formal background in child development, uh, but I obviously it's a great interest given what I do. I'm a big fan of experiential learning. I'm going to show it here. This is my daughter. I have actually flown on the Marie in Montessori uh, just a couple weeks ago, coming back from Amsterdam. Did you really? I did. Claim to fame. Check that one off my list. Uh, and uh, I once had miso soup with a sad tiger. These are my qualifications. This is on my CV. Check it out. Um, so the first uh, touchscreen app uh, that I designed uh, was SoundJaker. And we had worked for many years on interactive media on the desktop, and we had worked a little bit uh, on mobile, and I think we had this uh, constant feeling of what was this effort that a lot of people were having translating experiences from those old media onto this new device were not working. Um, so we did something really self-indulgent, and we carved out some time in our schedule, and we started launching apps like crazy. Um, in 12 months, we launched 12 months. We launched 10 apps. Wow. Um, very small, bite-sized apps, and each one was sort of an experiment to see what we could do. Um, so over the course of the next year, we launched app, 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 app. Uh, in total, we had 11 uh, of these apps under the tab, culminating in uh, Doodlecast, um, which was a, a drawing app that records you uh, as you draw. captures the audio as well as the screen. And it was a lot of fun. It wasn't necessarily tremendous business, but it was a lot of fun. We learned a lot, made a bit of money, opened some interesting doors. Uh, and then I met this guy. Um, on completely random, unplanned trips to Los Angeles. Uh, this is Bjorn Jeffrey, the senior of the And we uh, sat down over lunch and started ranting about the state of kids' interactive media, in particular touchscreen media, and then I think it got dark at some point. Like, it literally <laughs> was just hours of uh, going, going at us from every which angle. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a great conversation, and we kind of continued it off and on with it few months, and we actually decided in 2013 uh, that we'd set up a new studio. Um, so Sego Sego was born. Um, it's essentially a sister studio to Toka Boca. Um, the idea was that we will basically continue to produce what we love doing, um, and we would share expertise and resources. So, we started out by digging into our treasure trove of tickle tap material and uh, relaunching things. Um, I have to say, it's always nice to, we, are, we always talk about the, you know, the next thing, the new thing. How often do we get the chance to go back to something we've already done and make it better and better and better? Um, so we had, we had all this learning from this, the apps we had launched and play tested and seen in action and gotten feedback from. And we had this uh, fantastic opportunity to go back and just make them better. Um, so we started, I guess, in May of last year. It seems like so long ago, but it's not. Um, we launched Forest Flyer. We've been very busy since then, so we're now just launched, well, in the summer we launched Friends, which is our 10th uh, app in the series, uh, after, uh, what, 18 months. And 
things are going well. The, the, the new experiment is, is playing out how we approach it. Okay, so that's me in a nutshell. Say in a nutshell. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit is uh, really sort of our design process and thinking and criteria that go into our, our, our projects. And it all kind of revolves around uh, this, which is sitting with kids, playing things. Uh, we've sort of developed our own little ad hoc real style playtesting scheme. So depending on where we are in the production schedule, uh, normally it's everywhere between maybe every two weeks to every uh, longest stretch of maybe two months, uh, we sit down with kids. We do it often in our studio, but we often go out to kids' cafes, libraries, homes, uh, all over the place, anywhere you find kids. Um, and we set up plates. Um, so we have one person who basically is the facilitator, the host, um, who takes care of all practical needs of the kids and the parents. And then we have a couple of people who are just sitting down quietly and uh, playing the apps. And, you know, here's very quickly, you know, a very short summary of sort of how we, how we tackle things. Um, the, the biggest thing there is the sort of the play dumb point. Uh, what I liked in, Warren had a video earlier showing, you know, playing an app with a kid, uh, it was busy shapes and saying, you know, just watching the kid, letting them struggle, letting them fiddle. Uh, and then at some point in time, it's like, well, what do you think, what do you think we should do next? Um, sometimes we don't actually even tell the kids that these are our apps or that we built them or we made them. We just literally sit there and be like, let's look at this thing together. Um, it's something that you actively have to work on. And I, I kind of feel like we need to paint it on a wall um, because it's, you know, no one wants to watch a child struggle. Well, maybe somebody. Warren? No. Um, but we all want to come to their help, right? We all want to rescue them. Um, but there's no way you're going to find uh, the, the issues and the problems um, if, you're, if you're intervening like that. The way to think about it is it's your job to make the child struggle, but in the right way. Yes. <laughs> it's like controlled pain. You have to know. So you don't want to struggle with the interface. That's bad struggling. Good, good struggle. Yeah, there's good, good struggling and bad struggle. Um, one of the things we're actually discussing right now, maybe you guys have some ideas too, is how do we convey this message to parents? Because we're playtesting a lot of time with very young children, frequently the parent is in the room, and lo and behold, the parent wants to step in and say, like, you know, they want their kid to succeed, so they're the ones who are constantly intervening. We're trying to figure out, like, should we write them a letter? Can we talk to them beforehand? How can we approach this? Um, the other key things here are that we do our own playtesting, we involve people from the product team in the playtesting, and we debrief immediately afterward. This is not some kind of process where somebody goes out, does this playtesting, reports back some formal document of like, you know, here's what's going on. What we're looking for are solutions, practical, pragmatic ways that we can address and fix these problems. The only people who are going to be able to do that are the developers and designers who are building the product. And I'll let you know that nothing motivates a developer like a frustrated, crying child. <laughs> you know, and I, 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 so many times when I've talked to the developer about the initiative needs to be addressed, and they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I show them the video of the, of the, of the issue, and, and they're stuck to their desk until it's fixed. Um, it's also not uncommon that we actually go and address problems in real time during the playtesting. So the developers are literally running back and forth, making tweaks, bringing it back into the room with the next kid. We can see what's going on. Question for the Yeah. You said four or six kids? Yeah. Do you have them all in the same room? We always have them one kid so that they don't just end up doing what the other one's doing? No, yeah. We do it one at a time. So generally what we do is we invite them to show up about half an hour apart, one at a time. Um, it depends on the venue, but when we do it in our studio, we have that scheduled. And we always have an activity, uh, either a craft or drawing, um, that they can do. Um, uh, either before or after the waiting. Scott? Uh, Jason, how many people are observing and what does the room you're observing from look like? Um, so this is a good question. Um, I mean, originally, 
one of the goals we had recently is we had a room, we have a room that's got a lot of fun stuff that we do blow the lake over and other stuff like that. It actually caused a bit of a problem. Um, so right now we actually have a room, we use another meeting room. We, we have the lighting a bit low. Um, and we have some that's comfortable, it's just like a couch. We have child-sized furniture from IKEA. Um, the, uh, yeah, does that answer your question? How many people? How many people, yes. As few as we can get away with. So often it's just one. Uh, some, often it's one or two. Um, and we try not to have people coming and going during the play testing session, interrupting and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we try, the key is to kind of keep it, you know, there's two schools of thought. One is you can go the realistic route and like, how would this be used in situ, in the back of the car, and all of that. But when it comes to usability problems, we actually just need a very controlled kind of um, uh, quiet in the space. To do that. Um, and we we videotape. Very recently, we actually got this device called a it's Mr. Tappy, um, which is a little armature that you can attach to an iPad and attach a webcam to it. You'll see some footage that I've, I've taken with it. But it's been really uh, handy. Um, Mr. Tappy. I hope I get some percentage of sales from you. Uh, so really, it's a guy from New Zealand who just came up with this. It's kind of a very niche market. Um, but I can find it if you uh, find me later. Um, so you may have heard of this book, The Art of Game Design, uh, that this guy wrote. Um, it's an excellent book. And one of the reasons it's so great is it takes this approach of lenses. It's not just recipe like you need to do X, Y, and Z. It's Look at it from this angle, look at it from this angle, look at it this angle. So we've started writing our own lenses. So we have a Google Doc, and we think about what kind of questions or criteria we need to be thinking about that makes this a sado mini thing. And I'd encourage you to do the same. They're going to be different for, depending on what type of product you're working on, what kind of thing you're working on. Um, a lot of them are, uh, are also universal. So I'm going to run down. Uh, just eight of these. Um, so the first one is interface. And we ask ourselves the question, can this be done through direct manipulation? Basically, how can we kill buttons and other sort of UI elements which have been inherited down through the ages um, from platform to platform? Um, this is especially true when we're dealing with a child who has literally zero experience with these other um, so when you look at a lot of our apps, uh, they're, they're, a lot of the time it literally is, you know, the finger goes where the eye is. We put a bright yellow bell in the outside of the house, and that's how you start this experience. Surprise. Um, there's good surprises and bad surprises, right? So we want the kind of surprises um, that make the kid giggle, and Delightful surprises, but are not disorienting and completely throwing them off. I'll show you. Let's 
see the, the guts. Um, okay, so the next one is, is relatability. Um, and a big thing that I we talk about here is can the child kind of label um, the actions and the objects and things that are going on on the screen? Can they put can they put words in it? Can they vocalize it? Uh, does it fit within the sort of vocabulary headspace of a three or four year old? Um, and I, I've always had a big a bit of a, a, a heat on for software for young kids that use like outer space, for example. Very abstract, kind of crazy. But you know, the way we approach that is everything is a playground. So you know, we have a space explorer, but we just have a picnic in space explorer. There's a teeter totter in space explorer. Mm -hmm. There's all these very relatable kind of uh, items. Um, so responsiveness is so it's huge. Um, are you acknowledging? Uh, you know, the inputs, doing it right immediately. So this is Music Box, which is basically a, an app where you explore, you play with tempo. You play a song by tapping, but you don't tap on the keyboard, you just tap anywhere on the screen. Transitions from screen to screen. 
and a lot of dynamic loading and unloading of assets. Because we, we know that if for children this young, as soon as you sit there and you just say, like, you know, just hold a sec for the next thing. Mm -hmm. Even three seconds is enough for them to go to the home button. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to make these trade-offs. You have to decide, are we going to have this super high quality animation? Are we going to have this super amazing audio? And a lot of the time, you need to figure out how to you know, find that balance. But if, you, if you're, you know, uh, we, we had a notion server. We did all of the animation 24 frames a second. We had something like 6,000 frames of animation. Uh, it was lovely. It was gorgeous. But it necessitated about a four or five second spinny load screen of some kind. Um, we chopped it down to 12 frames a second. The animator cried a little tear. But it loads like that. And the ultimate, you know, the end experience was what we did. Big choice. Yes. I'm on my questions. Uh, details. So, the way it's described it, are there delightfully unnecessary details? Uh, I like to be able to look at every single one of our apps and just point to a couple of things that somehow got squeezed in there. A lot of the time, not through any of my doing, but some developer somewhere along the way just kind of thought of it, snuck it in there. Um, and it seems totally obvious in retrospect. So when we had this little activity in Friends where you water the plants, well, of course, if you hold the water over the characters, they <laughs> freak out a little bit. And again, it wasn't in the game design document, it wasn't one of those things. It just, it sounded like it kind of makes sense. Um, so you, you've got to embrace those. You didn't find that in kids testing that the kids wanted to do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, the kids that. often wanted just to water the characters, forget the plan. That's cool. <laughs> That's uh, So influence. Does the interaction lead to meaningful change in the app? So one way to test this is kid testing app, playing around, just give it a glance at any given point in the play experience. And are you looking at something which is the direct outcome of what they've done? Or does that look like the same bloody screen that would be if any kid was using? Um, so it might be that they've done drawing or painting, it might be that they've just manipulated the arrangement of things, it might be that they've moved through a space, but that's just a, it's a really good question to ask yourself. If, if, if three minutes into an app experience you glance down and you're like, yeah, that, that, that's the same, the screen looked the same way for the other 18 kids. Because you're not giving the kids anything, you're not empowering them. So the question here is, is control unnecessarily limited or taken away during play? We all uh, are limited control when we design the games, the tasks. Um, but we have to be able to justify every single uh, place where we do this. And a lot of time you'd be surprised when you take control away, it actually becomes a much better experience. So we're working on a driving game right now. And the original kind of plan was to have this car basically on a journey, nice fluid controls, went a little overboard of how you can do that. Um, but effectively, the car rode on a rail from beginning to end. Um, and in, in one of the builds, it was broken. Uh, the car was on a rail. You could actually do whatever you wanted with it. The results were positive.
look at your own products and ask yourselves a lot of these same questions. And I'm sure you could sort of twist and modify and generate your own questions um, that would apply. And if you're looking for a starting point, you know, start, start with the art of game design. If I had to pick just one of these, I'd focus on control, that last point. And, uh, it, you know, there's control in terms of specific application in how you design your apps, but there's also a bigger kind of issue here, which is, you know, our general inability to let children control their lives and environments. Um, I like to pull this picture up from time to time. So this, this is a, the designer between, behind the, the trick chair, so just a whole high chair. And one of the strokes of genius he had was he built um, adult <laughs> furniture like, to scale as if you were a young child, and his designers try to use it. <laughs> it's not fun. It's, a, it's an empathy building exercise when you start to realize that, you know, few things in this world are designed for kids. Um, so this is uh, just again, again a picture from one of our playtesting sessions. But I really, really like this one because it gives you this uh, sense. The kid is in control, and, and the parents are really proud of this, kind of this, you know, and take it over. And I think that, uh, you know, if nothing else, this device is unique in the, in the amount of control it, it offers hands over to the child. Um, uh, just this, this sense of ownership that they can have, you know, moving from app to app, from experience to experience, and from books to video to games. Um, and uh, I think that's amazing, and I think if we don't embrace that and we're designing, we are missing a huge opportunity. And with that, we conclude.
Um, so the question is, at what point do we look at interface in playtesting? Um, we think about it always, but the reality is that, um, uh, you know, when the, when the, when the playtesting for that, it really needs to come when most of the commands are actually done, which is unfortunate, because it's difficult for production to do. Um, we can look at basic mechanics through prototypes. Um, with uh, the driving game, we had uh, prototyped out Basically, you know, a, a car was a rectangle with circles, so that we could just work on the controls of the car, the acceleration and the braking, and how you could, you know, do all of that and make it feel really organic and natural. Um, so in that particular case, we 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 tackled that thoroughly. Um, other things that that you have to be careful though is that the visuals have a huge impact on this sort of stuff. Um, so color, you know, anything that's brightly colored or moves is where your eyes are going to go. It's where your fingers are going to go. So um, a lot of the time we make adjustments in those things. Once the finished artwork and animation starts coming in, we start to realize like they're you know they're they're going somewhere. What's those? Not. No. So you play your those first square. Yes. Yeah. We we play test uh, like very rough prototypes, very finished looking things. We play test apps we've already launched. Um, we play test your apps. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's all about uh, becoming like better informed designers, right? It's not just about do we fix this or this or change this to this. It's about being smarter and more empathetic to the child's point of view. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So my question is, um, you know, mostly about the depth. I think you guys yes, did a really interesting balance yes. of something that's detailed sure. and has kind of a infinite feel, sure. and yet when you break it down, it's so from a design standpoint, especially when we have a lot of running on the road, how do you guys balance like you know each infinitely programs or ever and ever design and screens and create a loop and how do you have those connected? Yeah, um, so that's a very uh, good question. Um, and the depth is very, you have to remember, it's perceptual. It's what the child perceives as depth, not how many road tiles and how many cars and how many this and how many that. And so one of the things we've, we've realized through making mistakes is that sometimes we'll add a lot of variety in one area when really the kid doesn't care. Um, it doesn't feel deeper because you've added six different versions of something. Um, so with, with the driving game, we have a number of vehicles. We have a number of different road tiles which are then programmatically kind of randomized. And then we have different destinations. And we had a long discussion about which of those variables we were going to invest the most effort in. Um, the, the cars who actually turned out to be one of the big ones. Um, so, you know, we've got uh, 10 cars, including a pickle car and a sneaker mobile and a, a, an ice cream truck. That was a good play testing suggestion that came out. Um, because that, that was one of those variables where actually we realized that, that would increase the perceived depth a lot. We can do one more. Um, no, not really. I think that uh, when it comes to icon design, we more worry about trying to um, make it eye-catching to make it something that you are going to look deeper and further into. Uh, more so than it being representational of what's actually going inside the app. You know, we want to hint at what's going on inside the app, but we're not going to try to tell the whole story of the app in an icon. All right. Thank Sir, you. thank you, Jason. Thank you.